Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Ron Fuller's Studcast. I am the great Ryan Last, and it's my pleasure to be with you once again as the Tennessee Stud takes us up and down that road, up and down the Smoky Mountains, as it were, teaching us all about wrestling history and his personal wrestling history. But without any further ado, let's get to him right now. The man of the hour, the host of the Studcast, the Tennessee Stud himself, Ron Fuller. Ron, how are you today? I'm doing great, Brian. Uh, very, very glad to be here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to get the old horse saddled up and uh, and uh, see where we're going to ride today. I think we're going to have a good one today. I think a lot of people have been waiting to see where we're going to ride today because we built up so well to it last week on the show. But before we get going, a quick mention here. By the time this episode is released, Super Studcast number 16 with Les Thatcher is out right now. Check that out patreon.com slash studcast or tnstud.com hear all about you've heard his name so many times here on the show ron talking about Les's involvement in the television in the production their friendship knowing each other way back in florida well we're going to talk all about all of that and so much more once again patreon.com slash studcast or tnstud.com more information later on in the show but ron let's pick up i guess where we left off last week Everything's really flying high in Knoxville. You got things going with this really hot angle. Yeah, we kind of got it. Kind of got it off the ground a little bit. And uh, today we're we're going to take a we're going to take a real ride for for sure with one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, maybe the greatest NWA heavyweight champion, uh, Luthez. Uh, my Southern title match on two fourteen seventy five in Knoxville with Thez is going to lead to a Southern Championship program with Ron Wright, which starts the following week on 221 of 75, February of 75. And we're going to talk about Southeastern Wrestling's beginning in the Tri-Cities of Northeastern Tennessee, specifically Kingsport. Uh, I will work a program with the famous club-footed Inferno, Rocky Smith. Uh, What a tremendous talent he was. And he's the guy that was responsible for winning almost all of their matches for him. As a matter of fact, uh, for that legendary team managed by J.C. Dykes, uh, these matches involve also the the infamous chisel. We're going to speak a little bit about the chisel today. Uh, we're going to pay tribute to the loss of a legendary babyface in the East Tennessee area that's going to affect the crowds for years there. Uh, and that is something really, really unusual to have a guy over to that to that point. But uh, we are going to talk about uh, Whitey Caldwell today. Uh, We're going to discuss my ideas for running matches in high school gyms whenever possible in the future. And uh, we're going to talk about the reasons that that made sense, so much sense to do that. Uh, So in essence, man, what we're going to do here today is we're going to we're going to talk about my wearing all the hats again. Uh, I'm going to wear the wrestler hat, the booker, the promoter and the owner hat uh, in this program today. And we're really talking about, as you just mentioned, about Southeastern wrestling kind of is beginning to take flight. Instead of just being a little Knoxville operation, now we've got a little something going on in the Tri-Cities. All of that is just going to expand greatly over the, over the next studcasts uh, as, as time goes by. But uh, really looking forward to it. So I'm going to jump right in, Brian. Uh, You know, let's start with the results of last week's match on February 7th, 1975 with Ron Wright and I for the future services of my secretary. Uh, Ron Wright gets on television and and, uh, nails me in the head with a chair from behind and then uh, grabs my secretary and lays a big kiss on her. And, and, uh, you know, so we decide to, to, to book the card and throw him on that card. He's not even booked on the card at all. Throw him on in the main event against me. And, and the winner is going to get the use of my secretary, uh, to, uh, whatever, whatever reason, Wright Wants her. I think Wright's really, uh, into her. She's a, she's a pretty lady. So and we laid out the angle last week of exactly how it all went down. Um, and, uh, obviously on this match, let's just talk about that particular match and what happened in the actual match of February 7th, 1975. Uh, my secretary, obviously she's with me. She goes to the ring with me and she stood in my corner during the match as was usual. Uh, Ron Wright kept throwing her kisses during the match and giving fans a treat just, you know, constantly, uh, 
not one to lock up, not one to wrestle, just making the real point that I really like her, you know, and uh, it just, uh, you know, just to make me mad and upset me. Fans really loved it. Got a big, about a big treat out of it. And at the end of that match, we're fighting in the corner and spinning each other around as we fought there in the corner and, and uh, my secretary reaches in. She's going to think she's had it in mind to re- grab his leg. I don't know why she – I didn't say you need to help me out in this match, but somehow we're spinning around there in the corner, and she reaches in to grab his leg, and uh, she pulls my leg out from under me by mistake. And I go down, and he covers me for a two-count. Almost wins the match right there. And when I kick out, I roll out of the ring, and I grab her pretty firmly by the arm and uh, kind of get in her face, you know. And, I, and I'm saying, hey, what the hell are you doing? You almost cost me to lose here. Well, right, he gets out of the ring behind me. I don't see him. And he sneaks up and spins me around, hits me with a big punch, and we start fighting on the floor. Instead of fighting in the ring, now we're fighting in the floor. And the referee counts us both out and declares the match a no contest. Uh, so there is no winner as we fight toward back toward my dressing room. Uh, and he's, he's trying to take over on me, but, you know, I, I can't go down there in the floor or anything because there's a whole lot of people around us. The, bill is, the building's full again. And uh, fans surround us as we start fighting up the stairway. It's a dangerous building. It has a, a, a stairway that has two segments to it. It turns back on itself and really, really dangerous situation in that little building there at Chilhowee Park. Uh, and as we fight up that stairway to the second floor, that's where my dressing room is. And she follows me, but she stays back from the crowd because, you know, there's people around us and they just, they're, they're right on top of us. So the police are even having a hard time. They, they're trying to clear us a path through the fans so that we can get back to the dressing room. And my great friend, Mac McMurray, that helps me buy the territory, uh, he gets right behind me to protect my back from the fans. He's seen a lot of these in Florida, and he knows where he needs to be, and he's watching out for me. And I am pretty, I feel pretty comfortable when I see he's there. I know he's going to be taking care of nobody getting to me from behind with a knife or no telling what. So the police finally get us to the dressing room, but my secretary is still outside the dressing room. Uh, she's, she stayed back from this, this near riot that's going on as we fight up to the dressing room. And then she's left out there with the crowd and Ron Wright. And uh, so he just grabs her by the hand and he takes her down to the ring. <laughs> so, and then when he gets the ring, he gets in the ring, he takes her into the ring and he raises her hand with his, you know, like I've won the match. Look, I've got the secretary. And uh, so the fans love it. They, there's a big pop. But, you know, the, a lot of people are still there. They they don't run home right away. They want to see what's going to happen as we fight up this upstairs and in, in toward the dressing room. So she then follows him back to his dressing room and he and he and shows up with him the next day on TV. So uh, I come out and I'm bitching about it all show long because you know he didn't win the match. Uh, it was a count out. Uh, neither one of us won, but he's sporting her around like he beat me. So, uh, and I say I keep trying to point to the fact that he doesn't have any right to my secretary. He didn't win the match. So, uh, and he even brings her out for for his interviews about. And he's interviewing about his match the following Friday night. He's going to be wrestling Dale Lewis. Now, Dale Lewis has been wrestling these fans from the crowd, but this time he's got a genuine opponent. Uh, he's, he's going against Ron Wright. And Dale has been doing so well that now he puts that $1,000 challenge out to anybody, including professional wrestlers. And on these interviews, she's out there and she seems to be, she's all smiles and seems to be enjoying herself being with Ron Wright. Uh, Big Jim S even asked her at one point during one of those interviews, said, who would you rather be with, Ron Wright or Ron Fuller? And she says, Ron Wright. And the crowd pops. And so he leaves the TV station on that Saturday with her. Uh, So, you know, he came in with her. He leaves on Saturday with her. I have yet to get my secretary back. So fans are loving the fact that he now has my secretary. You mentioned building up the card that will take place on the 14th of February. 
What was the rest of that card beyond the match between you and Luthez and Ron Wright and Dale Lewis? All right. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great card, actually. Uh, it's another pretty darn good card. We are still maintaining that momentum. Uh, first match is Dennis Condry against Tommy Gilbert. Probably the best first match we've had since I came to Knoxville. And I think the first match, every card is so important. It kind of sets the tone for the entire evening. Uh, Dennis Condry is a young worker at this point, but a good worker. Tommy Gilbert is an, uh, an established pro who's been around for a while. He's out of that western side of Tennessee where Jarrett works. Uh, Condry and him have a fantastic first match. I watch part of it. I like to watch those early matches to see how fans are into it and uh, what type of what I'm going to have to do later on in the evening. I think a lot of the old timers do that. They want to see those early matches because they want to know what they need to, what they're following and, uh, and how hard they're going to want to work and how hard they're going to need to work. Second match is Danny Hodge, who is a pretty much regular. Now he's working a whole lot in Knoxville for me against Jim Gagne. Uh, Jim Gagne, I don't really remember anything about Jim Gagne. I don't think he's related to Vern or Greg. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't know uh, how he got the last name, but that's an odd last name to have if you're not related to the great Vern. Uh, $1,000 challenge match on that card, obviously. Professor Dale Lewis versus Ron Wright. And uh, as I said earlier, Dale has beaten... By this point, probably at least 50 to 75 uh, fans that have challenged him. And he, he's, he's, he, it makes it look so easy, and it is easy for him, that he starts saying, not only am I going to give the $1,000 to anybody that can beat me that's not a wrestler, I'm going to give it now to anybody who can beat me it is because there are no decent wrestlers here. That's his point. And uh, now he's got Ron Wright. And, uh, you know, then I don't think I don't think Dale really thought that Ron was as tough as what he is. And uh, so he's going to have a really tough match with Ron Wright uh, on this night. And during that tough match, uh, you know, he's not going to want to wrestle anybody from the crowd after that match because Ron Wright pretty much takes it to him uh, in that event. Uh, I do think that uh, that Ron Wright wins, but it's by disqualification and Dale's. Dale's deal is obviously you've got to pin him. You've got to beat him in order to get the money. Uh, John Foley and Dutch Mantell are wrestling against Les Thatcher and Nelson Royal in a Tennessee tag championship match. Two out of three falls, Texas tornado with all four men in the ring at the same time and falls count anywhere in the building. Uh, crazy match. Uh, you know, I thought it, we'd add something to the crowd that people would, be, don't normally see and what a great match that was i mean they had matches on the stairs going up to the dressing room that we just talked about uh they had falls taken <laughs> on the stairs at one point there they went all over that building and uh, fought everywhere uh so then it comes down to the main event and that's the southern heavyweight championship uh, i put up my belt against the great Luthes, uh, and, uh, so. Uh, that, uh, that's the card and it's a pretty decent card. Uh, it's following everything else that we've been doing. We're coming off of those, that world championship in the Coliseum. We're coming off the Andre week We're we're, we're holding business up. We're coming off the kiss. Uh, now we're, we're doing it with, uh, with Luthez and a Southern heavyweight championship and a pretty, pretty darn decent card. I would say for that time frame. Well, one of the things that you can notice is because it's the 14th, that means it's Valentine's Day. Did you do anything special? I guess most promoters probably don't do special Valentine's Day themed shows, but anything you did special for Valentine's Day? Well, I didn't. You know, I you know, I, I realize this is going to be on Valentine's Day, but uh, Ron Wright, <laughs> he covers the he covers it for me. Uh, you know, so uh, as you noticed, it is Valentine's Day. So as I already mentioned, now Ron Wright is wrestling Dale Lewis on that Friday night, and he uses that Valentine's Day. To, he comes to the ring first, and he brings with him a huge bundle of long-stem red roses, 
and a giant heart-shaped red box of candies down to the ring with him. And I stand up above in this old building and, and watch what goes on. And I see him come down. And with him, he has my secretary. And uh, he brings her into the ring. And that a la the way Ron Wright likes to do things, he got to be dramatic about it. He 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 puts the he has the announcer hold the roses. He puts the box of candy down on the floor in front of her. He gets down on his knees and he takes the microphone away from the announcer and he asks her to be his Valentine in front of the whole crowd and. Uh, and then it, she nods it, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, so he, 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 then he gives her the box of candies and he gives her the roses. And then he gives her another big kiss like he did on the Saturday before. Uh, you know, just like out of the movies, bends her back. It's got to be dramatic. And all oh, the crowd is just loving it, man. He's got my secretary. He's got no rights to have her. And he's just really playing it up big time for the crowd. Uh, then, uh, after he gives her another kiss, uh, I, I can't take it. I, so I go down to the ring and I, and I grab the microphone away from the announcer and I, and I ask her, you know, what the hell is going on with you? You know, what's wrong with you? And a uh, right gives her a big hug and she responds with another big smile and the crowd pops again. They're just so loving the fact that he, that he's got my secretary. So I jump up on the apron and uh, right starts for me and, uh, and so Dale is coming down to the ring. It's his match. So he arrives about the time that Wright's got his back to him, and he and Dale just slides in the ring, and Dale's right from behind, and he just starts working him over right there. Uh, the referee rings the bell. They don't get an actual introduction at all. Referee just says, hey, the two guys that are supposed to be wrestling are in the ring. She jumps out of the ring, stands in Wright's corner, and the referee motions for him to ring the bell, and the, and the match starts. So... Uh, I go around. I'm already down there. I jump off the apron and ring. I see Dale's got Ron Wright taken care of. So I go around to her and I grab her by the arm. I'm going to take her back to the dressing room with me. And, uh, and she slaps me. Oh, the crowd pops. I mean, that's a big one. You know, they're kind of watching what's going on in the ring, but they're watching me and her. And once she pops me, slaps me, when I try to take her to the dressing room, I get a little upset. And then she takes the red roses a big whole bundle of them and just whacks me across the side of the face with them, scratches me up. The, the, the You know, I got a little blood on the side of my face. And uh, so, you know, it's just now she's really got things going. Uh, the, they're still going on inside the ring, but uh, the referee sees what's happening out there. The match is already underway. He grabs the microphone from the announcer down there, and he, he, he tells me specifically, you know, he says, he says, uh, Hey, if you don't leave the ring side right now, Ron Fuller, you're going to forfeit the Southern title in the upcoming match to Luthez. I will make him champion without this match if you don't leave. So I got to go. So I do leave. I leave. I go back up to my little platform up there where I can watch the matches from. And uh, and uh, I watch the battle uh, for it uh, with Ron Wright and uh, Dale Lewis from up there. Uh and the battle for my secretary still continues. Ron Wright still basically has got control of my, my my secretary still. What about your battle with Luthez? You, of course, being the Southern heavyweight champion, and Luthez being the legendary six-time former NWA world champion. Uh, well, we we do as what Lou always does. We do a whole lot of wrestling. Uh, and I know going into this match that uh, Lou is going to like that style. Uh, I try to call the match built around a lot of wrestling. Uh, Lou is just such an, a tremendous wrestler. Uh, he just makes every match look really, really good just with the wrestling alone. Uh, but I'm going to end up with him uh, in the corner. And, uh, and I'm going to take over on him, and I'm going to choke him down some, and I'm going to pound on him quite a bit. And that's the one thing that Lou doesn't handle as well as the wrestling, and that is that little bit of physical action. And so the referee forces me back to the middle of the ring. I've got him really pinned in the corner, and I'm just pummeling him. And the referee just finally gets in there and pushes me back to the center of the ring. And, uh, and then when he turns to go back to Thez, 
uh, I got a little surprised for Thez. You know, I figure maybe I can tap him out with something here. And I, I, I found me a nice little piece of metal and I, I taped it up and I pulled that metal out of my trunks and uh, Thez comes toward me. Uh, and the referee doesn't see what I've got in my hand, and I nail Thez, and down he goes. Uh, you know, he, he takes a good shot, and I got him beat. And uh, as the referee bends over to check him uh, and to see if, if he's going to be able to continue, it gives me an opportunity to put that little piece of metal back into my tights again. And uh, so he doesn't see it. Uh, but instead of sticking it into my tights, I fumble around there and I can't. So I have to quickly get rid of it. And I stick it under my left armpit and, and, and I hang my arm down close to my body so that it's, so that it's there and doesn't fall out. Uh, the referee counts him out, raises my hand, victory. Uh, I cover him, beat Luthes, center of the ring. And the referee counts him out, one, two, three. Uh, and then... Uh, I get up and uh, and I and he raises my right arm, you know, because I won't let him raise my left arm because I'm hiding something under there. And uh, so Ron Wright's standing up in that same area up there, and he sees what's going on. So as soon as he sees me bring out something out of my trunks, I guess then he starts racing to the ring. Anyway, he jumps in behind my back. Referee's raising my right arm that I've won, and and Ron Wright reaches over and grabs my left arm. And yanks it up in the air. And when I do, the, the little piece of metal falls down on the ring. And the referee sees it. Uh, so he rings the bell again. He announces that I'm disqualified. And he raises Thez's hand. So I've gone from getting a clear-cut victory over Lou Thez because of Ron Wright to now getting a victory in which uh, I, I lose. <laughs> victory turns to defeat real quick like uh and the finish sets up next week's main event with me and ron wright for the title and i'm ready for it because i have someone that night for the first time ever recording matches and he is recording that match so uh that's a real bonus for me to have that match now on on actual 16 millimeter we'll talk a little bit about that ron talk about recording it on 16 millimeter yeah, well, what I did is I had to find somebody that shot shot the film, actual film. Uh, back in those days, there's no video equipment. Uh, it's it's a, it's it's technology wise, we're back in the in the Stone Age practically. Uh, but but uh, there are people that shoot stuff on 16 millimeters. So I find at another television station, not the one I'm on, but at another television station, a guy that shoots this stuff, and I start paying him every week to come and shoot things at the arena for me. He also shoots outside specials that I do to get over because I'm not wrestling on TV. I do these uh, workouts with three or four guys at a time, uh, shoot workouts. And then I do these uh, programs in which uh, shows four or five minutes where I run stadium steps with three sets of leg weights and uh, shows what kind of workouts I do. Uh, that's the type of thing I need. And this guy starts to record these things for me. Uh, so on the next Friday, February 21st, I'm going to defend my Southern title against Ron Wright. And uh, because he cost, cost me the clear-cut victory over Thez. Uh, and Thez stays over, and he's going to work on that TV. So Ron Wright watches and talks over the controversial film from the night before. This is the very first time that anything that was recorded live is going to be shown on that wrestling program. Uh, and that's really historic for this show because uh, they they could have done it for years, but they had not done they gone to the trouble to have somebody do this. So the you know Wright's going to talk over the match, and he's obviously going to give uh, the forty five reasons he has why he ought to get a shot at Ron Fuller, you know. And and I got his secretary now. I'm gonna get his belt, you know. I mean. He's really enjoying himself out there. He's got her with him, and I mean, he's he's having a big heyday there. Uh, so, but then the angle, uh, the angle happens that's going to make this card another big night. I mean, if it had just been me against Ron Wright for my belt, uh, it would have probably done all right. But here's the kicker, and it happens right there on the program. So then, uh, Ron Wright, uh, Luthez comes out. 
the end of the match and he and he goes to Ron Wright and he thanks him. You know, I, I want to thank you for what you did for me last night. And I'm glad this is on film and everybody can see what he did. And you took uh, a loss for me and turned it into a win. And, you know, they get a little good friendship, a good vibe going between the two of them. And then uh, Wright says, uh, uh, he tells Ron Wright, he goes, you know, since in the last 24 hours, Ron, since this match has happened, uh, there's been a change, something that you probably aren't aware of. Southeastern promoters have decided to put a special referee in charge of this championship match next Friday night. And uh, so Ron Wright looks at him, and, you know, the obvious question is, well, uh, who did they pick? You know, right, right. Ask Luthez. He says, who, who did they pick? And big Jim S interrupts as, as always and says to Ron, right. Uh, you're talking to him right now. And he points to Luthez and the crowd pops, man. They, you know, gosh, Oh, Lou's going to referee the match. Well, right. Sells it great, obviously. And he's all smiles. And he looks at Thez and says, Hey, I'm going to be the next Southern heavyweight champion next Friday night. There's no way. He's going to beat me with you in my corner as you out there as the referee. So another big pop from the crowd. Uh, what we've done is is uh, one little add that one small element of Luthez being the referee for that match makes a whole different uh, deal out of that match. It makes it that much more uh, interesting for the fans. And I think it's it goes a long way in drawing what we draw the next Friday night. After they leave the desk at the end of the show, I come out and, and scream my dissatisfaction with the whole situation. Uh, the, the special referee and the fact that it's the guy that I wrestled the match before and, and the fact that my secretary is still in the hands of Ron Wright and uh, he didn't even win the match to get her. Uh, uh, it just uh, it's just really we're getting a lot done here with a little stuff little small things uh, again a kiss has produced a big crowd two weeks earlier uh, and, and now we got the momentum going we got a special referee that's going to produce the crowd for the following friday night and we really got some momentum going and uh and, uh, you know, things are really starting to happen in Knoxville. Uh, not so much other areas, but really starting to happen there some. Well, you mentioned at the top, Kingsport, Tennessee, you would end up running there during this period of time. Talk a little bit about Kingsport. Okay. Uh, as, I, as I said in the opening, uh, uh, I'm going to run Kingsport, Tennessee uh, three times in January. And I uh, didn't mention that part of it, but I'm running Kingsport three times in January and two times in February. Uh, I now have my Southeastern television program on. The show that I'm producing is being taped, and it is now being aired in Johnson City every Saturday due to my ever-growing relationship with Jerry Jarrett. His mother, and he owns that town, and he said, put your TV in there, Ron, and we're working an arrangement where you're going to get half the profit, and you run it. So the TV has not been there long enough to build a big crowd. And, and I'm going to realize that when I continue to try to run Kingsport, these five shows early on with that television being there, assuming and not being experienced enough as a promoter to realize it takes time to get guys over, talent over on the television. Uh, the show they had been watching was the show from Memphis. So they don't know these guys that I have. It's a whole different product. So that convinces me in the future that I need to hold off longer uh, when I start putting TVs in the markets before I actually go there and try to run towns. So, uh, and it, I, I realize I have to give my talent the opportunity to get themselves over. So Johnson City is going to be run on Tuesday nights. Once we start running Johnson City, it's going to run on Tuesday nights. That's a midweek event. It's been there for many, many years as a Tuesday night town. I see no reason to change that. Uh, but I'm trying to run Kingsport on a lot of Saturdays during this time frame. And uh, that fact uh, for Johnson City, once it gets going, is makes it even more difficult to draw during the week. So if I can't draw on Saturday night, bottom line is then I won't be able to draw on Tuesday nights in Johnson City until my television gets over there. Who were you working with around this period of time in Kingsport? 
Well, I remember one of these shows in particular, uh, and I worked main event with Dale Lewis as my manager and against Rocky Smith, who's managed by Ron Wright. And Rocky Smith is the guy that uh, the club footed Inferno that uh, was a star in that Inferno team that was legendary. They were really, really great team. And uh, they had were managed by J.C. Dykes. So I'm going to wrestle Ro- Rocky Smith in a in a singles match. And Rocky and I are pretty good friends. We have wrestled during that time frame in the early 70s when I started in Florida he was on top with those Infernos, and I wrestled and did a lot of flights with him with Lester Welch in the Caribbean that I don't like to really recall, to be honest with you. And uh, so I have a, a re- good relationship with Rocky Smith. So so uh, in this particular match, I remember Ron Wright comes to me to my dressing room early in the night, and uh, he offers his chisel to me he says here take my chisel and and bust up rocky smith he wants you to hit him with it and uh, you know i keep saying you know uh uh and he keeps telling me you know he, he's all right with it i say hey you know he i don't really want to do it ron i don't want it you know uh because uh, i really didn't want to bust him up with the chisel uh, i have an opportunity to wrestle a damn good wrestler rocky smith and and I don't want a bloody match uh, with a great worker like Rocky Smith. I wanted a great wrestling match. It's going to help build that town for me. Uh, so I sent the chisel and Ron Wright back to his dressing room, <laughs> back to Rocky Smith's dressing room and Ron Wright's dressing room. And uh, and Ron Wright comes three more times early in the night, and he just insists, you know, wanting me to use it. And, and uh, you know, I told, I told him uh, – I was accustomed. I wasn't accustomed to using a tool of destruction like this darn chisel is, you know. I mean, uh, but he just uh, kept insisting, and finally, just to shut him up, I took the chisel from him. And uh, you know, and maybe you know, I'm thinking uh, it, for for Studcast fans and Super Studcast fans, especially those that have listened to Number Two Super Studcast about Ron Wright. They're familiar with the chisel, but we've got a lot of new fans, Brian, and I think I'd like to take just a few minutes here or, or just a little time to explain what this chisel looked like. And it's basically a plate that's about uh, maybe three inches wide and the width of your hand. And uh, it was, there was, he had several different types of chisel, but the one he brought to Florida in 19, early 1970s, uh, had a way that you could slide it over the top of your knuckles and you made a fist with it. And then on the a- outside of that plate was a little piece of metal about an inch and a half long, stuck up about a half, or I'd say better than a quarter of an inch in height. And it was triangular shape. And he would file it with a emery board uh, to get it sharp as he could possibly be. And that's what he wanted me to hit uh, – Rocky Smith with, uh, and I didn't like the idea of having to use it. I didn't really want to use it. I'd only hit him with it one time, Ron Wright. And I told him on that match, don't bring it in the ring. And he brought it and he tried to use it. I took it away from him and hit him with it. But I really wasn't good at hitting people with the, with this tool. I mean, it was a horrible looking thing and uh, very, very dangerous. You're going to go to the hospital when you get hit with this one, especially if you don't know what you're doing. And that's basically what happens to me in this match. I really don't know what I'm doing. We're in Kingsport, Tennessee on the 12th of February. It is you and Rocky Smith. Yes. And, uh, you know, I've been kind of forced into <laughs> to using the chisel on Rocky Smith. And I really don't like the idea. But when it comes time to do it, I take it out and I slide it over my knuckles. And, and it's not it, it doesn't fit real smoothly and tightly to your knuckles. So it kind of has some movement in, in it. Uh, and and I've never hit anybody except for Ron Wright with it. And I, luckily, I didn't hurt him that bad, but I did cut him, obviously. So I get Rocky Smith in the headlock, and, and I, I'm going to use it on him. And I hit him. And I, when I hit him, I turn him loose because I'm expecting he's going to bleed. And he raises up, 
and there's he's not bleeding at all. And I'm like, I'm thinking, wow, you know, I, I did something wrong. So I grab him in a front face lock and then I hit him with an uppercut with it. And then I throw him up. I, I, I just grab his shoulders and push him up to where he stands up because I'm expecting he's going to be bleeding. And he's not cut. It didn't. I haven't cut him. And I'm like, now I'm thinking, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look bad here if I don't be, if I can't get blood with the chisel on somebody, that's not going to work. So I grab him and, and I'm not thinking properly at this point. I'm just frustrated that I, I'm even trying to do this. I don't want a lot of blood. And, uh, and, and so I, I grab him and I just hit him about three times, bang, 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 really fast. And every one of those cuts him. Uh, oh, I mean, it's just uh, he, it's just really, really blood everywhere. My goodness, I felt horrible about it. You know, I didn't want to hit him to begin with. And now I know he's going to have a lot of stitches here because he's just bleeding like crazy. But we go on and and it, it has the, this match has a bloody ending, obviously, and uh and it, and the, the thing that really got to me is it kind of convinced me that that uh, that building the Tri Cities and building East Tennessee and 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 making wrestling happen there and make wrestling the focus rather than blood and guts is really a ch bigger challenge than what I assumed. I can see now that, you know, I've got that influence of Ron Wright. I've got that influence of all these years that they've watched these bloody matches with the chisel. Uh, and I've got to somehow overcome it. And, uh, and, and, and since we're speaking of a challenge here, the, let's, let's talk about uh, a, a challenge that uh, doesn't really happen to many territories. And I find that this one is, has been there underneath the, all of these things that I don't know about my own darn territory uh, that I should have probably known before I even bought it. And, uh, and this challenge, it's, it's, it's based upon a tragic event that happens in East Tennessee that's going to have a dramatic effect on wrestling all of, all the cross eastern part of Tennessee uh, from 1972 into 1973 into 1974. It's just going to linger there. And it all is because there's a very likable baby face that, that had captured the hearts of all those people on the eastern side of Tennessee. A guy that's small in frame but huge in heart. And uh, the guy's name was Whitey Caldwell. Uh, and, and as a tribute to Whitey, uh, I'm going to use his photo uh, this week for this this uh, Studcast number 90 for the fans that want to see him. They want to get go to the website and check the gallery. He'll be on the gallery. He'll also be, if you want to uh, click on that Studcast and listen to it, he'll be the cover photo for number 90. Uh, and that's my tribute to him. Uh, I didn't really get to know him. Uh, and I never had the opportunity to meet him. Um, and, and, uh, but I heard great things about him from everybody, from Kevin Sullivan, from my brother, from Roy Lee Welch, uh, part of my family members that had wrestled partners with him. He wrestled a lot of tag matches against the rights and he had done it with my brother, with Roy Lee Welch, with, with Kevin. Uh, so he is over as a baby face as much as any wrestler that ever worked in East Tennessee. And, uh, he's the perfect opponent for the Wright brothers and for all the heels in that area. And when he dies, he dies in a, har a horrible car accident on a October 7th of 1972. He's worked television that afternoon in Knoxville. And that night he works a little town called Marstown and he's driving home from Marstown back up into the tri cities. And, uh, and he has a car wreck that, uh, that he dies in. And, uh, that car wreck, takes the wind out of the sails for wrestling in that part of the country. Uh, it hurt wrestling as bad there as if I'm going to use an example here. It hurts wrestling as bad there in East Tennessee as if Dusty Rhodes had just disappeared after he worked the big angle in 1974 to turn babyface. It just decimated business in that area. They had a hard time building 
somebody that had the power of Whitey Caldwell there as far as a baby face. Uh, some wrestlers are very hard to replace, uh, especially baby faces. Uh, baby faces take much longer to get them over than it does a heel. And so after Whitey's death, uh, I heard uh, several people tell me that business dropped off dramatically. Uh, some, some say up to 50%, some say 75% of audiences in some cities never return because they did not have Whitey Caldwell on those cards anymore. Uh, so, it, I just really had no idea the impact of this, of this guy when I purchased Knoxville. And, and, it, and when I really understood it, started to understand it, uh, it kind of explained the difficulty I was having increasing business. I didn't know that there had been a baby face there that was so powerful that his loss just really dramatically hurt business. And that kind of made it easier for me in my own mind uh, to to then feel, to realize why I was having a problem. It's not so much something I'm doing wrong. It's because they still wanted that same baby face. So luckily, what I'm going to do and start doing right away is I'm going to start to introduce many star baby faces in the coming years that will finally uh, eclipse the legend of Whitey Caldwell in Knoxville. And one of them is going to start very soon. Next couple of weeks, uh, Jimmy Golden, my cousin, is going to come in, going to get over tremendously as a baby face in Knoxville and in that area. And so I'm going to begin that struggle to build those great baby faces that can replace a guy like Whitey Caldwell. What else are you doing right now as an owner in Southeastern to build your company? I'm going to put on that owner's hat. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I've been doing, I've talked wrestling here. Uh, we've talked uh, booking here, uh, ideas here, angles here. And now I got to put on the, the owner's hat. I've got to figure out. Uh, and we're going to dive in into what makes some territories successful while others are not, not so successful. Uh, the decisions that are made by owners of wrestling companies are crucial. Uh, from the bookers they hire to the buildings they rent, everything affects the results of your business. Uh, when I finish setting up Southeastern Wrestling as a territory, uh, I'm going to run live events six days a week. I'm not there at this point, but that, that's what I'm shooting for. I have to have six towns a night, six towns in every week to run uh, to be able to be a bona fide territory. Uh, and only two of those six days are going to be working in the same city each week. Johnson City is going to become a regular Tuesday night card, and Knoxville is going to become a regular Friday night card. Uh, that makes Southeastern an unusual territory because it was it's going to have to depend four nights every week on smaller cities to survive as a territory. Uh, the Florida Territory... Uh, and most territories, as an example, have major cities running regularly every night. I'm not in a situation here where I have a lot of major cities to run. So one of the big decisions for me to make as an owner is, where are you going to hold these matches in these smaller towns? Knoxville is a great example. Uh, if I stay in Chilhowee Park, I'll always be small time and never hugely successful because the building is too small. If I stay there, I'm going to limit my ticket prices. I'm going to limit my gate receipts. That's going to limit my payoffs. That's going to limit my talent. Uh, and the, it's also going to affect the type of customer that I'm going to be able to get. And basically, that all it will, in, it will influence and limit my future. And uh, kind of, I can't go that direction. So obviously, real success in Knoxville is going to come through that Coliseum. And it's just as important in all these smaller towns where I'm going to be going four nights a week that they have Coliseum-like potential for me. Uh, they've got to have buildings, the biggest buildings that I can possibly get into, and they've got to be filled up in order to be able to operate a big time territory, because I'm limited to just those two major cities each week. Uh, some smaller cities in those little towns have little auditoriums or maybe a national guard army, but many in that part of Tennessee don't have any auditorium, nor do they have national guard armies. So 
I must be in the largest public building in each of those cities to take advantage of the, the maximum of receipts that I could produce at my box office for each one of these four nights every week. And my experience in promoting spot shows from Florida is where I get my answer. The largest drawing spot show of its day in Florida history was Vero Beach that I ran and promoted just north of West Palm Beach when I lived in West Palm. And the reason it did so well is because I was able to get into the high school gym. And so I realized that I had to do the same thing in Southeastern. I had to work with high schools throughout my entire growing territory to make that territory as successful as possible. I had to create a business relationship between my company and high schools throughout my territory. When you talk about building that relationship with the high schools, how did you actually do it? Well, schools around the country uh, were in need of, of money. And, you know, that that's never changed. It was back in those days, and it's still that way today. They, they're always have, they always have a problem getting the money they need, especially for their sports teams and stuff like that. So they had a need for money. And uh, they were having a very difficult time finding it in East Tennessee. Uh, things weren't good. Economy wasn't good. Uh, it's it's a struggling time for our country. Uh, and I started with a very small town in the mountains. Uh, I picked this little small town uh, because it was a smaller high school, and I really felt like if I can get this one, it will give me a start to being able to get others. So I picked this little small town. I don't even remember the name of it, Brian. It's really funny, but it was such a small town that uh, it's and it's 30 miles north north of Knoxville. So it's within the the real tiny little range that my television station has. Uh, so I know that there's an opportunity for me to draw here because it's not too far away for them to be able to get my signal, my television station signal. So I went there and I found the high school coach. Uh, and I kind of do this with almost all of these schools that I'm going to set up down the line. I want to get that high school coach involved, and I want to get the football coach, to be honest with you, involved. Uh, so I introduce myself to the football coach there, and, and I give him my idea uh, about what I would like to do to work with the school. And I do this because it's more it's it's a lot easier for me to sit and do this first discussion of how all this is going to work with a high school coach than it is with a principal. Uh, and then I'm going to give these ideas to the coach, and I'm going to say, now go to the, your principal and find out if you can talk him into it. So I let the coach talk the principal into it rather than me talk the principal into it. I find that this is going to work better for me. So basically – I was going to give the whoever does these programs with me 20% of the gross gate contributed for each event that I would run there, and the funds would be used by whoever the school wanted to to receive them. So the school really is going to get the benefit of this 20% of the gate that night, and they're going to decide who's going to get that money. That doesn't put me in that position where I'm going to create any enemies because somebody didn't get the money and it's their turn. It's up to the school to decide where they want that money to go. Uh, in return, I'm going to get the use of their gymnasium. I'm going to get announcements at their school every day for one week prior to that event. I'm going to get the use of the chairs, of their chairs for ringside. Uh, I'm going to get uh, the rights to put posters. I'm putting posters up on my end of this because I want to promote those towns. The posters are there anyway, but I'm going to have those people putting the posters out, go by the high school and leave three or four of those posters in the high school. And they're going to put them up in the hallways. And uh, this thing is going to be really promoted within the school. Uh, so uh, once I get the posters out, uh, and I'm going to even get, uh, I asked that I get a staff from the school that would help me to set up the ringside chairs and with any other support that I might need. And, uh, they're going to pay the police huh, for this event, uh, at, out of their 20%. So, uh, it's a uh, it's pretty pretty big basically there's a quite a few things that the school has to allow me to do to be able to get this money but uh it's it's a good, it's got real potential and what are the benefits for the school of you promoting these shows with them well you know 
the the benefits more i've kind of talked about the the uh the benefits to me obviously i'm going to get the biggest building in town and i'm going to get support from the from the everybody there and uh so uh it's the type of i'm supporting uh all kinds of projects for the community for for this 20 percent funds and uh and I could utilize the existing coaches to recommend the program. This, if I do it this way and I get these coaches on board and they go to the principal and they talk them into it, then it works and these buildings are full and the, the 20% of the gate is a pretty substantial amount of money. This program perpetuates itself. Uh, then, uh, then I can get uh, – and what I'm also going to have then is I'll utilize these coaches to – to to talk to other coaches i will be able to go to other bigger schools and i'll say listen if you want to know how it works call so and so and so and so and so and so give them a list of of high schools and where we've been and where we've had great results and that sells the program too you got these coaches talking to each other and they say hey this is a great deal man you need to get involved in it so uh and then the benefit to me that was really remarkable is that that I'm going to reach a really young audience that, that I'm going to have the opportunity to make fans out of high school students at an early age and an impressionable age in their life. And when they become wrestling fans from having watched these matches for years and years, right there in their own high schools, they're going to follow the sport forever. It's a great selling tool for the future of Southeastern wrestling. And what about that first school that you approached in Southeastern? What did they say? Well, obviously, I got the answer, yes. And and it came quick, uh, within two days. Uh, so that really pleased me. You know, I, I, now I realized that, you know, maybe this will work, and I've got a good idea here. Now I just have to fill buildings. Uh, and if I can fill buildings, it, it will be a success. So I got the answer in two days. I, I booked the small town. It's a little small town. And uh, we're going to run our very first high school spot show in early February, 1975. And like I said, it's a tiny little mountain town. Uh, it's so small that it, uh, it's not even on the maps. You know, <laughs> if you if you in back in those days, you, you everybody had maps and guys would pull out their maps and they couldn't even find this town on the maps. Uh, so, you know, the boys had a hard time finding it, obviously. And, uh, and you had to cross a, it was so small that you had to cross a one lane bridge to get to the gym. Uh, you parked on one side of a little river and then you crossed on a one lane bridge to get over to the school itself. Uh, strange little situation. So when Dutch Mantell and John Foley arrive, uh, they're pissed, uh, especially Dutch, you know, and they'd spend an hour driving around uh, trying to find the town and then they couldn't find the high school once they found the town. So Dutch, who was always a funny guy and full of wisecracks, he liked to really like to get on people. Uh, and so he jumps me as soon as he gets to the dressing room. And he asked me, how did I ever find this dinky little town? I think he put it something like that. And everybody in the dressing room had a big laugh. You know, I'm sure they were thinking the same thing. He had guts enough to say to me, right? And, uh, so then he says, uh, you know, he says, I'll tell you what I think you did, Ron. He goes, I'll bet you I'm right about this. He said, I think you probably took yourself a map and you pinned it up on the wall. And then you turned your back to the map and you took about five steps or five feet away from the wall. And you took a dart, Ron, and you just threw it over your right shoulder uh, at the map. Uh, and without looking, and then wherever that dart lands, that's the town you're going to run in. And uh, that, and that really had a big pop. The whole dress room had a pop at that one. Like, wow, oh, man, that's a great. Are you really serious? Do you think he did that, Dutch? Well, they all kind of laughed about that. And while Dutch is saying this, John Foley's climbed up on a bench. It's in, we're in a high school gym. Uh, we're in a dressing room. There's a bench there, and there's those high little uh, glass windows that you push out to get air into high schools. And didn't have any air conditioning in any of these high schools. And uh, John Foley's up on the bench, and he's looking out the window, and he's watching the crowd that's crossing the one-lane bridge to buy the tickets. And he screams to Dutch. He goes, uh, Dutch, come here. And Dutch climbs up on the bench, and Foley's, Foley's pointing at it. And the two of them are up there, and he says, uh, 
look at that kid riding the donkey across the bridge there. Right. <laughs> so Dutch looks back at me and he says, Stud, get your butt up here and take a look at this. Right. So I climb up on the bench with him, man. And uh, I'm looking out the window and, uh, and I, and the kid now has gotten across the bridge and he's kind of close to where we are. You can almost hear him. You can hear him talk and he climbs off of the donkey and he slaps the donkey on the butt. Right. And he, and he says, go back home and get mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I, could, I was like, my, now everybody could hear they jump up on the bench. You got to see the donkey go running across the bridge by himself. I'm like, Oh, come on guys. They, I mean, they're really, really having a ball here. They've making me, I, you know, they're just making me look like crap here, you know. Uh, so the whole thing is a big joke, basically, until the bell rang. And uh, and then they really had a hard time joking with me or making fun of it after that because that crowd in that gym was packed. And that made all the difference in the world to me, and it really made all the difference in the world to those guys as well. Well, it seems like that would be as good a place as any to end this week's episode, Ron. But as we do, we want to remind everyone on Facebook, you can become friends with the Tennessee Stud, the page, Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud. On Instagram and Twitter, you can follow him at Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last, and you can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts classic wrestling talk, and wrestling humor, the 605 Super Podcast. Want to remind you once again, Super Studcast number 16 is now available at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. For only $2.99, you get in the door. That's the entry level, $2.99. And you get to hear this Super Studcast with Les Thatcher, all about his history with the Tennessee Stud, his history developing Southeastern wrestling, and so much more. Once again, tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Ron, where are we going next week? Well, we're going to go find out who won the Southern title match between me and Ron Wright with Luthez as a special referee. Obviously, we'll discuss that match. And uh, we're going to discuss the infusion of talent that uh, we're getting from Jerry Jarrett's side of Tennessee. A lot of great wrestlers are are coming out of that part of uh, Tennessee now and uh, coming into Knoxville on Friday night. Uh, and there is another star that's about to move to Knoxville. I mentioned it a little bit earlier and it makes his very first appearance there. And that's my cousin, Jimmy Golden. And uh, we are going to begin to build also on this next one, the second Coliseum show in March of 1975. We're going to start to w- Talk about how you set up the pieces of the puzzle that makes another great card to take that second shot at the Coliseum. Ron Fuller's Studcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. For the Tennessee Stud Ron Fuller, I'm the great Brian Last. The story continues next week.